<sighs> Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality who barely made it. Finally got through the summer of Freddy vs. Jason, barely within schedule, somehow. But the point of it all is I can finally look at movies with a little more variety. Like Hatchet! Released in 2006, Hatchet is a more modern take on the 80s style low budget of horror flicks. At least at first glance, I can say they got the low budget part right, as it seems the most expensive part of the production was buying the cameras to film it with. However, despite the movie looking cheap, it also looks like the people behind it were actually fans of the genre, and it feels a lot more like a homage to the movies of old rather than just some kind of corporate cash grab. That's all well and good, but what is the oh-so-important plot, you ask? Well, a group of miscellaneous victims gather together, get lost in the woods, and are slowly picked off one by one by a misshapen madman with a hatchet! Or an axe, actually, because it's got blades on both sides, and that technically disqualifies it from being a hatchet. But, but nevertheless, let's take a look at Hatchet and see if it recaptures the magic of old. Or if I would have been better off leaving it in the bargain bin. The story begins on a dark and still night in Louisiana's swamp, where we see a father and son, Samson and Ainsley, played by Robert Englund and Joshua Leonard. They're hunting gators. Or, rather, Samson is hunting gators while Ainsley bitches and moans the entire time. See, no matter what I say, shut up, Ainsley, or you're queer, Ainsley, or why can't you be more like your sister, Ainsley? I said shut up, you little queer! See? And yes, I know, I just got off Freddy vs. Jason, and I immediately jump onto another movie with Robert Englund in it, but to be fair, he's not in it for very long. That's because when Ainsley finally convinces his dad to dock the boat so he can go pee off in the dark woods, the boy returns to find out the horror movie started without him. Yeah, tons of gore, but not the best gore effects. Even in the dark, it's pretty plain to see. Though I suppose if you're watching this on VHS, it would look a lot scarier. And I know there's someone out there watching this in 480p wondering what the hell I'm talking about. Before long, it becomes obvious to everyone involved that his father's death had nothing to do with gators. But never mind being ripped limb from limb in a swamp. It's time for some titties. <sighs> Boobs really are the backbone of the New Orleans economy. This violent shift in tone is the movie taking us to Bourbon Street to introduce the important characters. That being the guys leaving Bourbon Street, such as Ben here, played by Joel David Moore, who is growing weary of all this pointless titillation. Haven't you seen enough boobs? You, you mean there's a such thing as enough boobs? He does explain to Marcus, played by Dion Richmond, what he'd rather be doing. DeWitt and Robinson told me about this haunted swamp tour thing that they did last year. They said it was amazing. You see all these like floating lights and stuff on the water? You want to leave all of this to go look at some damn lights in a swamp? Well, to be fair, a swamp swarming with alligators does sound a lot safer these days. A swamp gas isn't going to randomly incite a riot to beat you within an inch of your life and then send you to jail for a couple of decades because it thinks you might have looked at it funny. Ben is adamant about his choice of bogs over boobs and leaves the group. Don't worry, though, Marcus recognizes he's far too boring a character to follow for the whole running time and tags along anyway, allowing them to reach Reverend Zombie's voodoo shop and meet the Reverend himself. What do you want? Played by Tony Todd. You know, the Candyman. From Candyman. Ben jumps right onto the topic of the Haunted Swamp Tour, only to be shot down by the Reverend, as he says he doesn't do night tours anymore because the insurance got too high. That's enough for Marcus, but Ben presses him for details. This results in a long, spooky tale about the last tour they went on and the tragedy that befell one of the tourists. He slipped. Hit his head right on the roof and sued me for negligence that cocksucker that's it hey it's the spookiest stories of all that end in litigation it's not a total loss though as the reverend points out a place nearby that still provides swamp tours as long as they agree that he never said anything be careful walking on the sidewalk and as he never shows up again for the rest of the movie now oh, well that, that is how cameos work Taking his directions, Ben and Marcus make their way down to Marie Laveau's House of Voodoo, where they meet a few new characters. 
titties. That's because Doug Shapiro here, played by Joe Murray, is filming a porno starring Misty the Blonde and Jenna the Brunette, played by Mercedes McNabb and Jolie Fioravanti. Jen is a professional at her craft, while Misty is uh, kind of an airhead. You're smitten. <laughs> I am actually going by horror movie standards, she's not that dumb. Just then, the swamp tour guide Sean comes out, played by Perry Shen, doing a questionable Creole accent. Why, I do the only haunted swamp tour? Real live ghosts? Ah, well, well, not live. Point is, they found their man and can take the tour for the low, low price of 40 bucks a head. Can you spot me? Oh, you don't have any cash? No, I'm just not paying for this bullshit. Yeah, it's bad enough when you wind up stranded in the horror movie setting without there having to be a cover charge on top of it. Point is, Ben pays, and on the bus they go, introducing the rest of the tourists. Mary Beth, the quiet girl in the back who is less than interested in Ben's awkward attempts at pickup lines, and the older couple, Jim and Shannon, played by Richard Riley and Patricia Darbo. At least I recognize Richard, much like he recognizes some of Shapiro's previous work. Well, have you ever heard of Bayou Beavers? Sure. No. no. Richard's been in a ton of movies, of course, but the one I recognize him most for has to be Tom Smikowski in Office Space. This part of the tour is less than interesting for me personally, as of course it's dark as all hell and I can't see shit. It does introduce how Jim seems to know more about Louisiana than their guide though, which gets under his skin. The water level is so high that sometimes things in the ground will rise back up to the surface. No, that's not why. But we heard... I said no! It's like they're dropping subtle hints that this guy is not actually a full-blooded Creole native. That's a Shyamalan quality plot twist right there. Fortunately, when they get off the main roads and into the swamp, the movie becomes much better lit. This means as they board the scare boat, they notice a madman screaming to the side of it. Jack Cracker, played by John Carl Bweckler. Or Bweckler. Bweckler. Did John Carl B. This swamp is closed! He's pretty much the Crazy Ralph-style character, warning the characters of the impending danger if they go forth. They're all doomed! But he's also a special effects guy who's got a lot of experience in the industry, from Troll to Halloween 4 to Nightmare on Elm Street 4 to Friday the 13th Part 7. Oh, and Hatchet! Once Sean gets the boat started, they leave Jack behind to drink his own piss. Like, uh... Yeah. Anyway, the tour continues like usual, that being a bunch of people staring at swamp waters in the middle of the night, which is not quite as entertaining as Bourbon Street. This is beat as hell. The only thing scary is Uncle Remus meets Bruce Lee. I feel like I'm an Enter the Song of the South or some shit. I don't think it'll surprise anyone to hear that Marcus is probably my favorite character in the movie. I mean, watching a derivative horror movie for the umpteenth time is just made so much more entertaining with some cynical jackass complaining the whole time, don't you think? The Haunted Swamp Tour, of course, has a few points of interest that Sean Handley points out, going over the tale of Victor Crowley, the deformed son of a single father. He was so badly deformed that one day, his father killed him with a hatchet. Heartbroken, his ghost still walks the swamps, calling for his father. That ain't the story. Well, that's the gist of it, anyway. It's not in the house. Guys, would you just let me do my job? Save my boss, and tell me, tell me, tell me, gong, gong, yeah? The plot thickens. But it's time for the big attraction as they turn the lights off to bring out the Swamp Ghosts for all to see. And right on cue, they seem to be wisping in, floating just above the water's surface. Nah, bruh. Those are marsh vapors. I've seen this on TV. Hell, man, why'd you not come then? Well, it's hard to have a horror movie when the teenagers think, you know, that old dark house is right there, but... I don't know, man, there's a Holiday Inn like a mile down the road. <laughs> Did you see that? I did. What was that? Ah, it's nothing major, just another highly recognizable actor for this movie. The man, the legend, Kay Nodder. He's only here for a minor jump scare right now, though, so Sean waffles around it being uh, another ghost before they move on. Right into a boulder in the shallows, damaging the boat and causing it to start sinking. Not feeling like sticking around to submerge themselves in the gator-infested waters, the group moves to clumsily climb across the rotting wood to safety. <laughs> Put that gun down, the sinking ship and alligators were enough of an incentive. With more than a little screaming and infighting, the group eventually makes it ashore, and then continues with the infighting. Does somebody want to tell me what the hell's going on? You went on a haunted swamp tour. 
boat sank. Now you're stranded. Second Amendment, it's her right. What, are you upset because, technically speaking, the alligators were unarmed? Does someone want to explain why Janie's got a gun? It turns out Mary Beth here went on this haunted swamp tour because her father and brother went out hunting alligators in this part of the swamp earlier, but never came back. So you go on the ghost tour? How, how does that make any sense? Well, 30 bucks for a boat ride was a hell of a lot cheaper than getting my own boat, wasn't it? That still doesn't explain the gun! Yeah, and why her ticket was only 30 bucks. Uh, she might have used the gun to... Well, um... Uh, let's call it haggling. She's still annoyed at Sean for screwing up the story of Victor Crowley so bad, though, so she takes over as storyteller while the movie provides some visual aids. Turns out, Victor Crowley's father was also played by Kane Hodder, and despite his son's deformations, he loved him very much. However, the local kids were a bunch of assholes who would torment the boy for shits and giggles. This eventually resulted in tragedy when, while using firecrackers to scare Victor out of hiding, the children inadvertently set the Crowley residence ablaze. So of course the children just say fuck it and ran away, with Victor Crowley trapped inside as his father gets home. The door is burning and he can't unlock it, so in an attempt to save his son's life, he tries to chop the door down. Victor was pressed up against the other side trying to get out. And tragically, his son's life was lost, with minimal gore effects, mostly off-screen. <laughs> After accidentally killing his own son, the Elder Crowley lived alone before he died in a fade-out. However, legend has it that Victor Crowley has risen from the dead and haunts this swamp, killing those who enter. It's become so bad that even the police have declared this sector of the swamp off-limits, something Mary Beth's father and brother hoped to exploit, alligator hunting in waters where they were sure no other hunters would be. Sean, however, doesn't buy this extremely different version of events. Besides, we are nowhere near the Crowley house. Okay, I already told you, it's on the other side of the river over two miles ago. That wasn't the house! How do you know? Because that is... Of all the places they could have sunk the boat, it just so happened to be right on the Crowley's doorstep. <sighs> Horror movies. Thing is, Jim's leg is injured from the gator bite, and they need to get to a road to leave the swamp. And the quickest way to a road is past the house. Obviously, after a Mary Beth's riveting tale of love and loss, the group is not very enthusiastic about this idea. Thus, it ends up being Jim and Shannon heading towards the house alone, while everyone else hangs back. The good Lord will protect us. <laughs> Not unless the good lord is the nickname for your concealed carry piece. Revealing to everyone that Victor Crowley is here and is visually murdering people in unspeakably gruesome manners. Or, speakably, he rips Shannon's head in fucking half. Then Mary Beth just shoots his ass and they all run for their lives. Did you kill him? I don't know. He fell down. You have more rounds in the magazine. I mean, you could have just walked up to him and shot him a few more times in the chest and the head for good measure. Just to be sure. That would mean they'd have to stop running and hiding, though, and Marcus wouldn't have wound up in a tree, able to point out the direction the city lights are in, so they can all march off together. Wait, where's Shapiro? It seems he's opted for the Blair Witch ending. Fuck it, the video stopped. Roll credits! See, now I can actually say that Victor is screwing Shapiro's head off, but you know, honestly, I'm just more bothered by the fact that the blood splashing on the trees looks the same as it did when he killed Ainsley in the opening. But of course, nobody knows Shapiro is dead, so they can get back to the important thing. In fighting over unimportant bullshit while being stalked by a misshapen homicidal maniac. Thus, Marcus berates Sean some more for crashing the boat and his phony accent. Say it again. I say it all night, you fake Jackie Chan Chris Tucker. I think I hear a little emerald, you confused wannabe. Why'd you just get off my case, asshole? It was an accident for Christ's sake. And the truth is revealed. Sean's real voice isn't even the Hong Kong fooey he's been making it out to be. Which makes sense when you consider the fact that Perry was born in New York. This is good enough reason to punch the motherfucker, but this extreme infighting is interrupted when Jenna finds Shapiro's bag. In it, they find out that Doug Shapiro was actually not Doug Shapiro. Those were fake business cards. He's actually Samuel Barrett, some nobody who pretends to have a porn company as a means to get unsuspecting porn stars to pose for nudie videos for him. Well, it sounds like a hell of a lot of work, deception, and cost, especially when you take into account the fact that the end result could be obtained easily by just buying a porno DVD. 
Anyone else have any more secrets? Because if I find out someone else is lying, I swear I'll kill you myself. I didn't really go to NYU. Yeah, we're pretty much out of twist at this point. Just good old-fashioned stalking and killing. Unless you count them walking in a big fucking circle right back to the Crowley residence as a twist. Hearing the killer is still alive and calling for his dad, the group decides to check out his place in case there's some weapons inside that they can use to defend themselves. Wait, we can work with this. Hit that motherfucker with another motherfucker! This is, of course, the bodies of Ainsley and Samson, Mary Beth's brother and father. While this distracts her and Ben from searching for weapons, the rest of the group stands around outside waiting to be killed. Not that they want to, of course, as a weird noise in the bushes arrests their attention. Looking closer, they find... A raccoon! Oh man, it's just a st <laughs> Who was in cahoots with Victor Crowley this whole time? Sorry, I just felt like it was time for another twist. Victor goes for Jenna with a belt sander, making short work of her face, before taking Sean down with a quick slice of a shovel. One easy decapitation later, and he finishes Jenna off with a good old-fashioned impalement. This whittles down the surviving characters to Misty, Mary Beth, Ben, and Marcus. At least for the next minute or so. Let's go, let's go. Which way? Um, that way. <laughs> Shit, you had a better sense of direction when you were just going in circles. They actually managed to slip away from the guy somehow, but then Ben has a great idea. They should go in a circle back to the house because he saw some gas cans in there, and with that, they might be able to stop Victor Crowley by lighting him on fire. Yeah, they're all out of bullets, so they head back and strategize. Ben goes in alone to see if he can find gas, Mary Beth and Marcus stand guard, and Missy stands off to the side so she can get picked off and nobody will notice. He just hit that motherfucker with another motherfucker. With their distraction dead, Ben looks out and finds some gas in the nick of time, dousing Victor in fuel and pulling off their plan without a hitch. Except, of course... You gotta be fucking kidding me! If Jason lives taught me anything, it's that God is rooting for the psycho killers. So they achieve nothing with this and go back to the original plan of just run the fuck out of the swamp. They're finally making progress, at least, coming across a graveyard, which surely will lead to a road. In, in theory. That was the only game. Oh damn, man, it's back into the woods! <laughs> damn! Now, honestly, that's the one guy I was hoping was gonna survive this horror movie. It's pretty clear he's not gonna come out from behind the tree later perfectly fine once Victor rips his arms off and splatters his head against the graves. That means it's down to Ben and Mary Beth. I, I guess I can try and feel invested in them. Where do we go? <laughs> oh no, Victor's coming for Ben. Too slowly for my tastes. But wait, there's only like five minutes of movie left, so Ben powers through and bends the pull downward, while at the same time, Victor becomes incredibly stupid and rushes straight into the extremely obvious impalement, getting stabbed clean through the shoulder, because that's always fatal in these kinds of movies. So, uh, happy ending. Ben and Mary Beth manage to escape because there's a convenient boat nearby, and they can just drift out of there with no worries that there's going to be some final scare before the credits. Okay, never mind. Everybody dies! Well, considering the half dozen times you knocked Victor Crowley down and didn't stop to finish him off, I venture to say you deserve that. Anyway, that was Hatchet. And it is a low-budget horror flick for fans of low-budget horror flicks. And I am a fan of those, obviously. Even so, I don't see Hatchet having much appeal outside of its very specific target audience. The story is as basic as they come, the characters aren't deep or complex, and the gore is over the top. A horror movie that embraces what it is isn't a bad thing, of course, but it does mean that there really isn't all that much else to say about it. 
Kane Hodder did a good job as Victor Crowley, and if you ask me, it shows he can play one Psycho Hermit one way and another in a very different manner, as we all know his portrayal of Jason Voorhees was imposing and intense, while on the flip side, he plays Victor as more of a feverish, frenzied killer. When it came to the main cast of victims, though, there wasn't a lot to work with. The acting was rough, and enough to keep reminding you that you're watching a movie, which isn't good. And while I feel like Ben was supposed to be the main guy for all intents and purposes, he was far from my favorite. Obviously, that would be Marcus, and Jim was entertaining as well, even if Mr. Riley wasn't in the movie for very long. When it comes to the scare factor, though, the movie does come up short. The situation should have a lot more dread than it comes off with, but the campy nature of the direction doesn't really work to draw you in and take it seriously. There are a handful of jump scares, but the only way this movie's going to freak you out is if you're not desensitized to the spectacle of dismemberment yet. Overall, Hatchet is a fun movie for fans of the genre to pop on and enjoy, plus the various cameos of big names in horror are nice to geek out over, but the whole package comes off as being decidingly below average, despite what entertainment can be found. Coming in at two, Psycho Killers being wounded and then given more than enough time to get back up and keep murdering your friends. Out of five. Or, as I've often said in the past, two out of five. I love it! Thank you all for watching, I've been Dr. Shadow, and remember, in order to avoid being disemboweled and ripped apart, scared and alone in the swamp, just stay on Bourbon Street and get shit-faced. I'm so psyched I did this. That fade you had in high school. What? It's about as classic as that fade you had. Too late. Why? You still on classic? <laughs>